this lecture we essentially define what a group is and we see a little bit of basic properties of a group. What is a group? Group theory is mostly about symmetries of objects. In some cases, we take a geometric object like a manifold or um, like uh, solutions of certain system of linear equations or system of binomial equations. Or uh, we take combinatorial objects like a graph or we take a crystal from chemistry. In some sense, physics is all about symmetries of universe. So group theory appears in different parts of sciences and mathematics. Now, in some cases, when the symmetries of the objects that we are interested in is, is uh, complex enough, if, if our object has enough symmetries, then understanding that symmetry, the set of symmetries is enough to uniquely determine the object. Of course, that kind of objects would be extremely interesting. And you see some of these examples when you study Galois theory or when you study covering the spaces of topological spaces. Now, one meta level, um, at the meta level, um, uh, one can say that the whole mathematics and in general, modern science is about finding patterns as we want to reduce the amount of uh, complexity or data that we need to study and we need to store. By knowing these patterns, we don't need to know every single case, but rather we, it's enough to understand that this pattern is appearing here, so it is similar to the other problem that we have already solved. So knowing these patterns and recognizing these patterns in different parts of sciences or mathematics can help us to, so to speak, lower the complexity of the objects that we are studying. And that's why understanding patterns and understanding symmetries is kind of crucial in different parts of mathematics and sciences. Okay, but what is a group that's study in this type of um, pattern recognition themselves, this kind of um, symmetries of objects um, that appear in different places in an axiomatic way itself. So now what is a group? A group is a non-empty set G with an operation. Now, what do we mean by an operation? An operation is a function from g cross g to g. We often denote it by a dot or a plus. So we take a pair of elements from this set g, let's call them g1 and g2, and this operation gives us a new element inside this set capital G that we denote here by g1 dot g2. You can think about multiplication of numbers or addition of numbers. You can think about multiplication of matrices, or you can think about composition of two functions. We will see more examples and more detailed kind of discussion, discussions later. Okay, now this set and this operator, this operation, not operator, but rather an operation, this set and this binary operation is called a group if the following properties hold. So first of all, we need this operation to have um, the associative property, meaning I should be able to rearrange parentheses and end up getting the same result. So if I first multiply G2 by G3 and then multiply G1 by this result, I should end up getting the same as g1 times g2 and then times g3. Of course, the order of multiplication is also extremely important. This operation needs to have a neutral element. What do we mean by neutral element? 
we call E a neutral element if no matter what element we pick from the group G, G dot E should be the same as E dot G and that should be G. So it's a neutral element with respect to this operation. Every element needs to have an inverse. What does that mean? Every element that you give me in this set needs to have an inverse. This means there should exist some G prime inside the group, inside this set, so that G times G prime is the same as G prime times G. And this product is a, a neutral element of this set with this operation. If we have these three properties, we say the pair of G and this operation is a group. Sometimes when the operation is clear from the R setting, we simply say that G is a group. Now, there are some ambiguities in this definition. For instance, um, can we have several neutral elements? If we have only one neutral element, can we have several inverses? We have to address these ambiguities, but uh, let's start with uh, some basic examples. So if we look at the definition, we need an operation. For this operation, we need the following properties. It should be associative. It needs to have a neutral element, and every element needs to have an inverse. Now, the following with the following examples come from numbers. If I look at the set of integers and addition, or set of rational numbers and addition, or set of real numbers and addition, or set of complex numbers and addition, all of them are groups. Let's uh, quickly check some of the properties. For instance, we already know that addition is associative. Now, zero is a neutral element of addition, even in complex numbers. So every complex number that you give me, when I add it to zero, or add it from right or left, it doesn't matter. I end up getting the same complex number. And notice that um, addition is commutative. If I add x by y, if I add x to y, it's the same as adding y to x. So some of these uh, commutative relations I don't need to write again and again. So 0 is a neutral element. Now how about finding inverse? So every complex number does have an additive inverse that we often denote by negative x. So if I give you a complex number x, then it has a negative additive uh, inverse that we call negative x. So if I add x to negative x or negative x to x, I end up getting zero. So every element does have an inverse inside complex numbers. Now, if you notice all these sets instead of integers, as a subset of complex numbers, they are closed under addition. If I add two integers, I end up getting another integer. If I add two rational numbers, I add up, end up getting another rational number. Or if I add two real numbers, I end up getting another real, real number. So plus addition defines a binary operation on all of these sets. And zero belongs to all of these sets. Moreover, all these sets are closed under taking neg negative. So if x is an integer, negative x is also an integer. If x is a rational number, negative x is also a rational number. And if x is a real number, then negative x is a real number. So all of these examples satisfy the properties uh, of being a group. So all of them are groups.
Another set of examples would be uh, non-zero rational numbers under multiplication and non-zero real numbers under multiplication and non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. Again, we notice that multiplication is an associative uh, operation. One is a neutral element for the multiplication. And uh, that means no matter what complex number I give you, x dot one is the same as one dot x and it is x and one belongs to all of these sets. One is a rational number and therefore it is also a real number and therefore it's complex number, it belongs to all of these sets. So all of these sets uh, have neutral elements and let's also point out that all of these sets are closed under a multiplication and therefore multiplication um, does indeed define an operation on all of these sets and it is associative, it has neutral element. Moreover, every non-zero complex number has a multiplicative inverse. One over z is still a complex number. If it's a non-zero rational number, then it is still uh, the inverse of a, uh, a non-zero rational number is still uh, a rational number as it is m over n and m and n, both of them are non-zero integers. Therefore, it's inverse, multiplicative inverse is n over m is again a non-zero rational number. And of course, if x is a non-zero real number, its inverse is also a non-zero real number. So altogether, we get that the set of non-zero rational numbers under multiplication forms a group. The set of non-zero real numbers under multiplication forms a group. And the set of non-zero complex numbers under multiplication forms a group. Now let's see some non-examples. So if I look at non-zero integers, even though it is closed under multiplication, it is not a group. So non-zero integers under multiplication is not a group. Or non-negative integers under addition is not a group. Again, let's point out that, of course, if when I add two non-negative integers, I end up getting another non-negative integer. So addition does define an operation on the set of non-negative integers, but this is not a group. Let's see why. The set of non-zero integers has a unique neutral element under multiplication. Of course, one is a neutral element under multiplication, but my claim is that it does not have any other a neutral element under multiplication. Let's see why. Suppose that E is a neutral element under multiplication. What does that mean? It means that when I multiply one by E, because E is a neutral element, I'm supposed to end up getting one. But of course, one times E is just E. That means E is one. So we just showed that there is a unique neutral element in the set of non-zero integers under multiplication. Now suppose um, I give you a non-zero element, non-zero integer like two, in, and I ask myself, does this have a multiplicative inverse in the set of non-zero integers? If two has an inverse in the set of non-zero integers, that means what? That means for some x in the set of non-zero integers, two x is a. But that's a contradiction. Now, two x is a is is one okay. it's supposed to be a neutral element but there is a unique neutral element as we discussed that means for some integer x 2x is one so here i meant not a as a variable but rather a neutral element of this set but this set uh, under multiplication has a unique neutral element that is one therefore we get that 2x equals to 1 needs to have a solution in the set of non-zero integers. But that's not possible as this side is even and this side is odd. So we end up getting a contradiction. And therefore, 2 is not invertible 
in the set of non-zero integers, and therefore the set of non-zero integers and multiplication is not a group. A similar argument applies to set of uh, non-negative integers. First, we discuss and we show that the set of non-negative integers has a unique neutral element under addition, and that is zero. Of course, zero is a neutral element and it is a non-negative integer. So zero does belong to this set and it's a neutral element. Now claim is that there is no other neutral element in this set. So suppose E is a neutral element. By a similar argument, we add it to zero to the neutral element that we have and we deduce that they should be the same thing because E plus zero, assuming that E is a neutral element, is supposed to be zero. But we know e plus zero is e. That means that e is zero. So there is a unique neutral element in the set of non-negative integers under addition, and that is zero. Now, um, if you pick any non-zero element inside this set, it cannot have an additive inverse. For instance, let's pick one. My claim is that one, which is a non-negative integer, does not have an additive inverse in the set of non-negative integers. So suppose it does. What does that mean? That means one plus x for some x in the set of non-negative integers should be a neutral element of this set under addition. But we just showed that this set under addition has a unique neutral element and that is zero. So this means x plus one equals to zero needs to have a solution in the set of non-negative integers. But that's impossible because x being non-negative, one being positive implies that x plus one is at least one and one is more than zero. So this equation has no solution in the set of non-negative integers. Therefore, the set of non-negative integers in addition is not a group. But let's see another interesting and positive example. If I give you any integer, let's say at least two, when I look at the set of integers modulo n, under addition, it forms a group. So z sub n and plus is a group. Um, so why is that the case? We need to discuss why it is closed under this operation, why this is an operation. We need to discuss why it is associative. We need to discuss why it has a neutral element under addition. And finally, why every element has an inverse. All these properties we have discussed already. We had showed that it is indeed a well-defined operation. We showed that uh, the residue class of zero is a neutral element of this operation. We showed that um, the inverse of the residue class of x is the residue class of negative x. So altogether, we have that this is indeed a group. Now, um, when I look at the set of units of set of integers modulo n, we still end up getting a group. When we discussed properties of the multiplicative, uh, the, uh, the mo properties of units of integers modulo n, we essentially checked all of these properties. We showed that it's a well-defined operation. Then we multiply two units, we end up getting another unit. We discussed that this is associative. We showed that the residue class represented by one is a neutral element of this operation. And finally, we showed that every unit has an inverse that is also a unit. So the set of units uh, of units of the set of integers modulo n forms a group under multiplication. Now let's see uh, one example that's kind of related to the set of units 
if we use our intuition from rational numbers or complex numbers, we might be tempted to say that the set of units is the set of all the non-zero elements, but we have already discussed that this equality holds precisely when n is a prime number. So next we actually show that the set of non-zero um, elements of integers modulo n under multiplication is a group precisely when n is prime. Okay, let's start with the, this direction that we have already discussed. Assume that n is prime, and I wanna show that this is a group. If n is prime, we have already proved that every non-zero element is indeed a unit. So Zn cross, the set of units of integers modulo n, is the set of non-zero elements of uh, the set Z sub n. And we have already mentioned that the set of units of Z sub n is a group under multiplication. So this direction we have already proved. If n is prime, then this set is a group. Next, I want to show that if this is a group, then n is prime. And we are going to show the contrapositive of this statement. What do I mean by that? We are going to assume that n is not prime. And we will show that in that case, this is not a group. In fact, we will show that in that case, multiplication does not define an operation on the set of non-zero integers. We will show that there are two non-zero residue classes whose product is the zero residue class, and therefore it cannot be this cannot be an operation on the set of non-zero integers. This is our goal. Now, again, we are proving the contrapositive. That means we are assuming that n is not prime. But notice, the assumption says that n is at least two and it's an integer. So not being prime means that it has at least two positive divisors. Uh, more than two positive divisors, at least one positive divisor, which is neither one nor n. So when we say n is not prime and n is an integer that is at least two, that would imply that n can be written as d times d prime, where both d and d prime are positive integers that are strictly more than one and strictly less than n. In particular, that implies that the residue class represented by D and the residue class of D prime, both of them are non-zero residue classes because they are strictly more than one and strictly less than N, we deduce that they cannot be the zero residue class. But at the same time, when I look at the product of these residue classes, we end up getting the residue class of n because d times d prime is n, we get the residue class of n, which is the zero residue class. And that means that multiplication is not an operation, um, is not an operation on the set of non-zero uh, non elements of C sub n. So this implies that implies the contrapositive. So the set of non-zero elements of C sub n forms a group under multiplication if and only if n is prime. Okay, now in the arguments and examples that we were discussing here, in at the beginning when we wanted to show that um, the set of non-zero integers under multiplication does not form a group, or the set of a non-negative, uh, the set of non-zero integers under multiplication, and the set of non-negative integers under addition does not form a group. In, in both of these cases, first we discussed uniqueness of a neutral element, and then we use this to show our claim. Now, the question is, is this statement always correct? Can we have two neutral elements 
for an operation? And the answer is no. So if an operation has a neutral element, then it is unique. So the next lemma is essentially uh, about uniqueness of neutral elements in a group. But here I'm not going to assume that G is a group. I'm going to only assume that uh, G has an operation and this operation has a neutral element. And then on that, on that, that assumption, I show that it has a unique and neutral element. So suppose E and E prime are two neutral elements under this operation, then E is E prime. Therefore, in a group, I have a unique neutral element. Okay, let's see why this is the case. The proof is identical to the examples that we had. We consider E times E prime. Then we say, okay, because E is a neutral element, when I multiply E by something, by some other element, it's not going to change it. So E times E prime is just E prime. Now I'm going to use the fact that E prime is a neutral element. Because E prime is a neutral element, when I multiply it by some other element, it's not going to change it. So E times E prime is just E. So it is both E and E prime. So E is simply E prime. Therefore, I have a unique neutral element in a, uh, in a group or a, a group with a set with an operation that has a neutral element as a unique neutral element. Next, we are going to show that if an element has an inverse, like in being in a group, then the inverse is unique. So there is every element in a group has a unique inverse. Okay, so from this point on, then we can talk about the inverse of the element G. Instead of saying an inverse, we can say the inverse. Okay, so that's the assumption. We start with a group. I give you an element, and the claim is that this element has a unique inverse. That's the claim. What do we mean by that? That means that if G1 and G2 are inverses of G, then they are the same. Now, we never formally defined inverse, so let's make sure that we understand what that means. We have already showed that there is a unique neutral element in, in a group G. So let's denote uh, the neutral element of the group G by E sub G. So E sub G denotes the unique neutral element of the group G. Now, we say G1 or G2 or G sub I is an inverse of G if when we multiply G sub I by G from both sides, we end up getting the neutral element of the group. So G sub I times G is the same as G times G sub I, and it's supposed to be the neutral element of the group. Okay, so now the proof that these two elements should be the same is actually pretty interesting, it's nice. And you might have seen it in linear algebra when you when you show that if a square matrix is both uh, is invertible from right and left then these right and left inverses are the same so if you look at the argument it's actually um, uh, the same argument works uh, with a bit of less assumption so we can just assume that g1 times g only from left is the neutral element of the group, and G times G2 only from right uh, is the neutral element of the group. If I have these two, then G1 is G2. So we say G1 is a left inverse and G2 is a right inverse. So here we are showing in this lemma that uh, when I have an operation and an element g, small g, has a left inverse, g1, and a right inverse, g2, then they are the same 
and the same elements. Okay, we, in this course, we don't um, emphasize on right or left inverses, and we don't work with them extensively. But here, I just wanted to mention these phrases, um, just in case you see it in some of the books that you browse. Okay, so let's see uh, how the proof goes. We start with G1. Knowing that E sub G is the neutral element of this group, G1 is simply G1 times the neutral element. But instead of writing the neutral element, I can change it and use the fact that G times G2 is the, the neutral element. So instead of E sub G, I'm going to write down G times G sub 2. Now I'm going to use, to use associativity of this operation and write it as g1 dot g2 uh, g1 dot g dot g2 now using the fact that g1 dot g is a neutral element we get that this product the whole product is the neutral element of the group times g sub 2 but e sub g is the neutral element so that means this doesn't change g sub 2 at all i end up getting g sub 2 I started with G sub 1, ended up with G sub 2, so they are the same elements. That means that uh, every element has a unique inverse. We are going to call that uh, the inverse of G, and in a multiplicative setting, when my operation is not written by plus, uh, the multiplicative, the, the inverse is denoted by G sub negative one g to power negative one and if we are using the additive notation where then then we often denote the neutral element by zero and the inverse of g is often denoted by negative g okay these are conventions quite old conventions and we are going to use the same conventions so again g to power negative one denotes um, the inverse of g in the group capital g as long as we are using kind of dot or star any operation that's not plus and if you are using plus operation then the neutral element is denoted by zero and uh, inverse of an element is denoted by negative g so, so far we showed, we discussed um, uniqueness of neutral elements, uniqueness of inverse of an element. Now let's see a bit more basic properties of groups. For instance, what can we say about inverse of product of two elements? So I give you G and H inside the group. Now, what is inverse of G dot H? We do know that it is inside the group, it has an inverse. Can I have a formula for it? And the formula is quite similar to what you've seen in linear algebra. When you multiply two square matrices, two invertible square matrices, you end up getting another um, invertible square matrix. And the inverse of that product is simply product of uh, inverse of the second um, element times inverse of the first element. The same rule applies here. Let's see why this is the case. Since inverse of every element is unique, in order to show that inverse of g dot h is this guy, it's enough to show g dot h times this guy is the neutral element of the group as we multiply g dot h by this guy from left or right. So if we show that these equalities hold, um, and no matter how we multiply this element, we end up getting the neutral element, we can deduce that um, this product is indeed inverse of g dot h. Okay, so we start multiplying g dot h by h inverse times g inverse. And because multiplication is associative, we can reorder them in whatever uh, way we want. We can put the parentheses in the middle for the middle terms and then uh, multiply uh, the elements as we, as we wish in whatever ordering we choose. 
The point is that H times H inverse is the neutral element of the group. Now, when I multiply G by the neutral element, I end up getting G back. Now, this G inverse we did not touch, so we end up getting G times G inverse, which is the neutral element of the group. Similarly, I can multiply from the other side. Again, we use the fact that I can choose um, whatever ordering I want for the parentheses and first multiply the, the middle two terms, end up getting the neutral element using the fact that E sub G is a neutral element. We can write down this as simply H to power negative one and then H inverse times H is the neutral element of the group. So as we multiply these two elements from both directions, we ended up getting the neutral element. And because of the uniqueness of inverse of an element, we deduce that this is simply inverse of G dot H. This shows our lemma, which is an important lemma. This gives us a recipe of finding inverse of product of two elements. The next lemma tells us that taking inverse of inverse of an element gives us back the element. There are at least two ways of showing it. Both of them are rather easy. One way is, uh, I'm going to discuss a bit more detail, but one way that I did not write it over here is again using uniqueness of um, inverse and saying that because G times G inverse is the same as G inverse dot G and it is the neutral element, this shows that G is the inverse of G inverse because it's the unique element with these properties. From here, we can deduce that uh, inverse of G inverse is simply G by the uniqueness of uh, inverse of an element. This is one way. Now, an, an alternative method is the following. Again, we start with G inverse times G being the neutral element, and we simply multiply both sides by inverse of G inverse. Okay, we multiply uh, from left, so, and then we choose this ordering. That means when I put the parentheses whatever order I want. So essentially I wrote this element to on both sides. So G inverse inverse times this side, and then I choose this ordering. So I get this on the left-hand side. This is the neutral element. So on the left-hand side, I end up getting simply this product. On the right-hand side, I get inverse inverse times the neutral element. So inverse inverse times the neutral element. So on the right-hand side, I simply get G inverse inverse. On the left-hand side, let's look at this. The first product is just the neutral element of the group. Neutral element times G is simply G. So neutral element times G is supposed to be inverse inverse of G, which means G is inverse inverse of G. So there are two, two ways, both of them are rather easy. Now from this point on, we know inverse of the inverse of G is simply G. Another important property of um, groups and operations inside the group is the cancellation law. What do I mean by that? If I tell you g dot h is g dot h prime, we can deduce that h is h prime. So multiplication by g is a one-to-one -one map from the group to itself. g dot h being g dot h prime implies that h is h prime. So why is that the case? I mean, and similarly, we can multiply from, we can cancel out uh, from right as well. Here I'm canceling out from left, but we can also cancel out from right. Meaning if I tell you h dot g is h prime dot g, I can cancel out g from right and deduce that h is h prime. So why is that the case? Let's start with this equation. G dot H is equal to G dot H prime. And multiply both sides by the inverse of G. 
So as we multiply both sides of this equality by inverse of g, we get this, that g inverse dot g dot h is g inverse dot g dot h prime. Now using associativity, I can reorder the parentheses and get that it is g inverse dot g dot h is the same as g inverse dot g dot h prime. But this is the neutral element of the group. This is the neutral element of the group. I end up getting that it is H on the left hand side and H prime on the right hand side. So H is H prime. The other, the other one is quite similar. This time we are going to multiply by inverse of G, but from right. So I'm not going to write that one. Okay, so, so far we discussed that uh, inverse of g dot h is h inverse g inverse, inverse inverse of g is g, and we have cancellation law. If g dot h is the same as g dot h prime, then h and h prime are equal. If h dot g is the same as h prime dot g, then h is h prime. Now, Another important convention is this exponent convention. For a positive integer n, g to the n is simply g dot g dot the dot, dot g n times. And because, uh, because a multiplication is associative, I don't need to emphasize in what order we are putting the parentheses. It doesn't matter. We end up getting the same multiplication. Now, what is g to power 0? The convention is that g to power 0 is the neutral element of the group. How about g to power negative and um, negative integer? We, we use uh, the inverse convention. So g to power negative 1 is simply the inverse of g. g to power negative 2 is inverse of g raised to power 2, which means I take inverse of g and multiply it by itself, absolute value of n times. So g to power n is g inverse raised to power negative n multiplied by itself negative n times. Notice that when n is negative, negative n is positive, so it's okay. So altogether we get that we get this def definition that g to power n is product of g by itself n times if n is a positive integer. It is the neutral element of the group when n is zero, and it is inverse of g raised to power negative n if n is negative. Even though the definition might look a bit complicated, but it is quite um, natural and it satisfies the equations that uh, often numbers had satisfied, meaning g raised to power n, the whole thing raised to power m is equal to g raised to power n m for every pair of integers n and m. We are going to prove this equality. This is an important equality. We are going to use that again and again. Um, we are going to show this equality by considering uh, many cases. But the idea of the proof is rather easy, uh, but the proof is uh, kind of uh, painful. Um, but let's go through the steps. Um, at the end of the day, I expect you to know how to use this formula and be uh, comfortable with it. Okay, so let's start with the case where both n and n are positive integers. Essentially, we are going to consider various cases depending on signs of n and n. So suppose n and n, both of them are positive integers. Then what does a g to power n raised to power m mean? g to power n raised to power m means that I have to multiply g to power n m times because m is a positive integer. I have to simply multiply g to the n m times. But what does g to the n mean? g to the n means that I need to multiply g by itself n times. 
remember n is a positive integer therefore g raised to power n is simply g times g dot 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 n times so i'm taking this element and repeating it n times and multiplying them all together this means i'm ending up writing m n times i'm writing g m n times and multiply it by itself that's simply g raised to power n n as we expected now what happens if m is positive and n is negative then what does g to power n raised to power n mean it's similar to the previous case because m is positive this is simply g to power n times da 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 g to power n m times the difference is here because g to power n now is not g times da 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 g n times because n is a negative integer it doesn't make sense to say n times g to power n is its inverse multiplied by itself negative n times and i have to repeat writing this element m times and multiply it by itself so that means i'm writing inverse of g negative m n times this times this i'm multiplying inverse of g this many times that means g raised to power negative of this positive integer that's mn so that's simply g raised to power mn as we wanted now let's consider the case when m is negative but n is positive then in that case g raised to power n raised to power n means that i need to take inverse of g to the n and then write it negative m times and multiply it by itself negative m times now inverse of g to the n means what is g to the n n is positive g to the n means i need to multiply g by itself n times and then find its inverse as i find its inverse then i need to write it negative m times and multiply the whole thing but what is inverse of g dot 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 g times g times g and so on we have already proved that when i multiply two elements find its inverse i need to find inverse of each one of the terms and multiply them in a reverse order here all the terms are the same all of them are g this means i need to find the inverse of g and then multiply them the same number of times so this means inverse of g to the n is simply inverse of g raised to power n so g times g times g n times raised to power negative 1 is g to power negative 1 inverse of g multiplied by itself n times okay so now i can plug in this for this for this and i end up getting that i have g inverse multiplied by itself n times and then i need to write this negative m times and multiply the whole thing by itself that means i'm writing g to power negative n i mean the inverse of g negative m n times and that's by definition g raised to power negative of this integer which is m n that's exactly what we wanted to show now let's uh, discuss the case when m and n both of them are positive uh, are negative sorry and maybe it's easier to think about it like this that m is negative r and n is negative s and r and s both of them are positive let's see um, how this can help us to simplify and the computation we we are interested in g to power m raised to power n that means we are interested in g to power negative r raised to power negative s and we want to show that this is the same 
as g raised to power rs. Okay, so what is g to power negative r? r is a positive integer. So g to power negative r is inverse of g raised to power r multiplied by itself r times. So this is simply inverse of g raised to power r. Now you, you notice that this is a positive integer. This is negative. So I can use one of the previous examples and deduce that this element, which is raised to a positive integer and then raised to a negative integer, is simply, so if I call this element x, then x raised to power r and then raised to power negative s, x, s is simply x raised to power negative product of these two integers, negative r s. So now I'm going to plug in inverse of g for x. I did use that g raised to power negative s, right, r raised to power negative s is simply this one. And this, instead of, so think about g inverse as x, I put it over here. And I did use that it is g inverse raised to power negative rs. But that is inverse of this element raised to power rs. Remember, r and s are positive integers. So when I raise an element to some, not, to some negative integer, I need to find its inverse and raise it to the power of the absolute value of that integer. So I need to find inverse of this element and then multiply it by itself rs times. But be sure that inverse of inverse is the element itself. So inverse of inverse of g is simply g. So I'm multiplying g by itself rs times. That is g raised to power rs as we wanted to show. The only remaining case is when one of uh, either m or n, uh, one of these integers, is 0. So let's just start with the case that m is 0. That means g, g to the n raised to power m is simply the neutral element because m is 0. And then mn is also 0. So g raised to power mn is also the neutral element. So we get the equality in this case. If n is 0, then g to the n is the neutral element. Neutral element raised to any power is going to be neutral element. Because if it's positive, I'm multiplying neutral element by itself. And that means I'm not changing it at all. If it is negative, then I'm multiplying inverse of this neutral element by itself several times. But inverse of the neutral element is itself anyway. So in, in, in either case, we get that um, any power of a neutral element uh, is the neutral element itself. So e sub g raised to power m is simply e sub g. And uh, when n is 0, mn is 0. Therefore, g raised to power mn is also the neutral element. So we get the equality in this case as well. All together, we proved that g to the n raised to power m is g to power mn, no matter what integers m and n you pick. Now, let's point out a convention um, that we use for additive groups. When, when, I, when we use plus as our operation, instead of using exponent, instead of writing g to the n, we simply write ng. This is the usual convention that we have for numbers. Now, we use the same for groups as well. So ng is g plus g da da da, then we do it n times, assuming that n is positive. If n is zero, we are supposed to end up getting the neutral element, and neutral element in this setting is denoted by zero. And when n is negative, we have to take the inverse of g and add it by itself, negative n times. Remember, n is negative, so negative n is a positive integer, so we have to add it negative n times. This is the convention that we are going to use when um, our operation is plus.
Now, in that setting, instead of writing g to the n raised to the n is g to power m n, we, are, we have that n g times m, m times n g is the same as m n times g. This is uh, the additive version of this equality. Instead of using the exponent, we have to multiply by integers and we get this equality. Another important property of exponents is the following, which is crucial in our later uh, study of groups. Uh, for every integers, m and n, when I raise g to power m and multiply it by g to power n, it's the same as g raised to power m plus n. Essentially, again, I'm working in a group uh, that has uh, operation dot and then g to, g to the m dot g to the n is simply g to power m plus n. In the additive format, it would be like this mg plus ng is m plus ng. So it's quite intuitive. The notations are quite intuitive. And we are going to show that, in fact, this intuition is correct. And we, we are allowed to use uh, this equality in an arbitrary group. Similar to the previous case, we are going to study, we are going to show this lemma by considering various cases depending on the signs of M, N, and their summation. Let's start with the case um, that M and N are positive. Similar to the last case of the previous lemma, it is better to work with positive integers instead of um, negative ones. That's why we are going to use this notation. M is going to be uh, its sign, which is either uh, one or negative one or zero, depending on whether or not M is positive or negative or zero. So M is going to be its sign times its absolute value. N is going to be its sign times its absolute value. So in either case, R and S are non-negative integers. And sign is either one or negative one or zero. Okay, that's going to be our convention. Um, uh, that's going to be our setting for this lemma. Now let's start with the case where both m and n are positive integers. Then g to the m is simply g multiplied by itself m times, and g to the n is g multiplied by itself n times. So altogether, I'm writing g n plus n times, m here and n here. Altogether, I get m plus n g's, which is simply g raised to power m plus n. Now, let's consider the case where m is negative, which means it's negative r, n is positive, and r is strictly less than s, which means m plus n is also positive. So m plus n is positive, m is negative, and n is positive. Then, uh, because S minus R is positive, R is positive, S is positive, we get that G raised to power S R times G to power R is G to power S. Okay, so G to power S minus R is the thing that we are interested in. That is essentially M plus N. And that is simply G to power S times inverse of this g to power s times inverse of this. But g to power r times to power negative one is g to power negative r. We have proved this kind of equality before. So we get that it is g to power s times g to power negative r, and that's exactly what we wanted to show. We wanted to show that g raised to power m plus n is g to power n 
times g to power m. Okay, maybe I have to be slightly careful over here. We wanted to show g to power m times g to power n. So let's, uh, let's make this a bit more. So let me be sure about the ordering. Actually, I have to put g to the r to this side. Write it like this. And now let's multiply both sides of this equality by g to power negative, g to power r raised to power negative one by inverse of this. And that is g to power negative r times g to power s, which is exactly what we wanted to show because this is simply g to power m and this is simply g to power n. So we end up showing that g to power m plus n is g to power m times g to power n. Okay, now let's look at the case where again m is negative and n is positive but this time m plus n is negative r is more than s so again by the first case where both the powers are positive we can deduce that g to power s times g to power r minus s is g to power r this is not uh, what we are interested in we are interested in g to power s minus r that means we need to work with inverse of this one. But let's start finding this, isolating this first, and then looking at its inverse. In order to isolate this, I need to multiply by inverse of this element. So g raised to power r minus s is simply g raised to power s inverse times g to power r. Again, this, this is, now I want to find inverse of this one. I find inverse of both sides. So the inverse of this side is equal to inverse of the product of this, this side. But we've discussed that product inverse of product is product of inverses with the reversed order. So that is essentially inverse of this term times inverse of this term. That is g to power s minus r. Now, inverse inverse is just the element, so I get g to power s. And this is g to power negative r. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. That's g to power m times g to power n is g to power n plus n. That's exactly the equality we were looking for. Now, what happens if so far we discussed the case that m is positive, n is positive, m is negative, and n is positive. Now, what happens if n is 0? If m is 0, then g to power m times g to power n is the neutral element times g to the n, which is simply g to the n. And at the same time, because m is 0, n is n plus n, so we get this equality, this product is g to power n plus n. If n is zero is identical argument, g to the n times g to the n is g to the n times the neutral element, which is g to power n, and m is n plus n because n is zero. So if either m or n uh, is zero, we are done. If n is positive, we are done. So altogether, the only remaining case is when n is negative. Uh, so when n is negative, that means n is negative s and s is positive. In that case, um, we look at m minus s and s. This, these are pair of integers and s is positive. 
We have already discussed that if I have two pair of, um, if I have a pair of integers and one of them is positive, the second one is positive, then I can use the rule that g raised to power m minus s times g raised to this positive integer is g raised to power of summation of these integers. Because as, as s is positive, I can add these two and I get this equality. But of course, I'm interested in g to power m minus s, which is g to power m plus m. By isolating this, which means by multiplying by inverse of this, we achieve that equality. We get that it is g raised to power m minus s is g to the m times inverse of this element. But g to power s inverse is g to power negative s. And that's exactly the equality we were looking for. So all together, we have considered all the possible combinations for m and n when we end up getting the g to the m times g to the n is g raised to power m plus n in any group. So these are basic properties of group operations and basic examples of groups. And we mainly discussed the examples that came out of numbers where operations were rather easy. All these examples that we discussed were a billion you were allowed to switch in the order of the elements. In the next video, we will discuss examples that come actually from symmetries of objects. And often in those type of examples, uh, we don't have this commutativity condition. Okay, so for now, again, let's uh, repeat what we have already uh, discussed in this video. We defined what groups are. We show that in every group there is a unique neutral element. We show that in a group every element has a unique inverse. We show the cancellation law. We show that inverse of g times h is h inverse times g inverse. And we show that um, uh, inverse of inverse is the element itself. What else did we show? We, should, we define the x notation and we show that g raised to power n the whole thing raised to power n is the same as g raised to power n n. And finally, we discussed that g raised to power n times g raised to power n is equal to g raised to power n plus n. Till the next video.